Thank you, Richard, and welcome to the students. Um, a very special welcome to Prof. Paul Skelton. Um, he is an internationally recognized authority on aquatic biology, and his name is synonymous with the conservation of freshwater fish across Southern Africa. He, he is publishing another book on the uh, fish of Southern Africa later this year. We look forward to the publication of that. Um, and without any further ado, welcome, Prof. It's the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johan. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very, very much for your time, for coming to listen to me. I hope you enjoy what I've got to say about the fishes of the Okavango, which is really an African treasure to be conserved uh, and and uh, treasured for what it is. So I have had a long association with the Okavango, um, starting way back in 1982 or thereabouts when we visited Lake Ngami. And my first slide, which has moved on a little bit, uh, just showed the mud pool that was in Lake Ngami dry enough and my first encounter with the fishes of, of the Okavango. The Okavango and, and Lake Ngami was first discovered from the Western perspective by Dr. Livingston in about 1851, 1852, thereabouts. And it wasn't very long thereafter that the first fishes were collected by scientists. In fact, uh, that drawer you see on the slide at the moment shows a cichlid, and that cichlid in the middle there was collected from Lake Ngami and also the holotype of the tigerfish. There it is. They both exist to this day in the University of Liège in Belgium. And I've had the privilege of seeing those specimens, exactly those as you see there. They were collected in the 1850s. So my talk today is gonna to talk first of all about the Okavango, which to me is an African jewel of a wetland. I'll then talk and give you some interesting uh, ideas and so forth about the diversity of Okavango fishes. And I'll end off with a few comments around the conservation of this treasure of ours, which is rather an urgent matter at this point in time. So the Okavango, as we all know, is a river system that ends in the desert. Uh, if you look at the map of Africa there, you'll see some very powerful and big rivers, the Congo, the Nile, the Niger over there, Zambezi over here, Limpopo, Orange, and stuck in the middle of this little dark patch is the Okavango. The Okavango system uh, embraces four countries, Angola, Namibia, uh, Zambia and Botswana, of course, where there is the Delta. So I'm going to speak about more than just the Delta. I'm going to take you into Angola, where there are two major branches, the Kabango coming down here and the Quito Quanaval coming in there. And they both have their story to tell as well. So the Okavango sits at the heart of the Kalahari sand. This over there, if you Look at there, you'll see this green outline here. That's the outline of the sediments of the Kalahari sands, which we call the Kalahari Basin. There. And there, with mound, is the Okavango Delta. And it's a vast basin, and it's a fairly large catchment when you look at it in perspective like that. That middle map, you can see the, the catchment itself. And over on the right hand side, I just show a little bit about the elevations of where the, where the water in that lovely delta comes from. It comes from the, what they call the highlands of Angola, over here in the western half of Angola, most of the water. But this major branch, the Quito, falls in the middle and it's a sandy, uh, sandy substrate as opposed to the rocky substrate of the Kabango. 
The Okavango Delta is an interesting one from a geomorphological perspective. It's actually seen nowadays to be the southwestern extension of the great East African Rift System. How's that? So uh, all those great lakes that you get, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, uh, Lake Rukwa, and so forth in the western branch of the Great Rift. And they're coming down Luangwa Valley, which is an older rift, and it was severed by this western rift of the East African, the more recent one. Uh, it formerly used to flow out through Tanzania. Now it was severed, and the Luangwa flows down to this way. But the Okavango over here is seen as an extension and probably an actively extending part of the African rift. And some Geologists have suggested that in many, many million years in the future, that there's going to be a split here. And this part of Africa is going to separate from there, right along where we've got the Okavango. If you look at the structure of the, of the Okavango and uh, within the basin, the Kalahari Basin, you'll see these lines drawn by the geologists here as upwelling. This is where many of the drainages and the basin nature of the sediments have been captured. And the, the, uh, the actual drainage lines have been severed. So at one stage, the, the drainage from the highlands over here probably went out across there and out into the Indian Ocean. Then you've got these upliftments here that cut that off and caused the basin to be formed. The whole nature, you'll see the, the rifts that cut across here and formed it. The next slide, you've got an a actual Landsat view of the Okavango Delta, and you can see some of those rifts. There, very straight lines there, across that area there, and down here to the Malakani, where the delta is truncated. And then, of course, it travels off into the Mahadi Shadi. If you look at the fault lines, there they are. There's one there and along the Samalakani River there. And if we look at how that basin forms, you'll see that there's actually a rifting and a slipping down, and this has been filled in with level sediments. That's why it's so flat, because it's been filled in with these sediments, and it just flays out. There's no clear drainage and until it hits the fault lines and then drains out again. And the, the paleo geologists tell us that this was also once a much larger lake. In times, in very pluvial times as they talk about, when it was very wet and there was lots of water coming down from the highlands and from other drainages that I'll tell you about, as this was a lake up to several tens of meters deep. And today it's, of course, just dry pan. And this is an alluvial fan. It's not really a delta. It's an alluvial fan of a former lake bed coming in there. Nonetheless, its structure is deltaic. And so we continue to talk of it as a delta. And we, there are many ideas about the former drainage that filled this up and what happened uh, over time. This is very important from the fish perspective because we ask questions of how did the fishes get there? Where did they come from? Those sort of questions. And the only way we can answer it is if we understand Earth history and the drainage patterns that go back in many, uh, over a long period of time. And the the geologists tell us that if we go back some 65, 50, 65 million years, that's a long period of time, long, long time ago, the Africa drainage, there was probably an outlet to the Congo Basin to fire what is Tanzania today and out into the Indian Ocean. Yes, it didn't flow to the Atlantic, it flowed over that way. Uh, Likewise, the 
the Okavango and what was the Okavango, the highlands in this part, probably drained out through the Limpopo Valley. This bulge in Africa here, they say, is a massive and a very long period where the Limpopo formed a delta into the Indian Ocean. So big that if you look at it today, just look at that bulge and you look where the Zambezi is, there's no bulge at all or very small. So this was a massive river system, a really long and big river system that drained out through there. And then finally, uh, in the Miocene, Pliocene, when Africa collided with Asia and the Hessian Seaway, as they say, was closed off, the climates of the world changed dramatically and the ocean currents changed dramatically. And all of a sudden we had a cold water current coming up the west coast of Africa. And that cold water current is largely responsible for the dryness of the western half of southern Africa. And in the Miocene, there was a great desertification, as they say. This was a desert bigger almost than the Sahara Desert today. And it formed these Kalahari sands. And, and then uh, as time went on, the drainage pattern uh, developed more or less to what you see they are today. The Rift Valley had a, a very fundamental uh, part to play in the Okavango drainage because it created a, a division here, a watershed, and a highland over here where drainages flowed down into the Kalahari Basin. And many of the fish relationships that are emerging as we get to know them better are showing that here, yeah, this part of Africa, the Chambeshi and the Kafui have parts to play. They were once linked into what is now the Okavango Basin. And the fishes share that linkages and show that link. So here is a, a thought diagram, if you like, of, of, of what has happened over the last uh, 50, 60 million years and how the fishes have arrived. There are basically two centers from where the fishes of this area have, have arrived. The one is the Congo Basin, and that basin has provided some of the older elements, some of these things like the Mormiras, and I'll tell you about them just now. And over here in the high Africa, so this is a much higher elevated part of Africa to this part here, which is the north and north, the northwest. So this eastern and southern part is what they call high Africa. And the fishes of high Africa largely derived from Asia uh, when Africa collided here in about the Miocene times, about 25, anything less than 25 million years ago to the present day. And the Rift Valley system, these red lines here, developed in the last 8 million years or so. And over that period of time, a lot of the fishes are connected from here Something, there you go, from this period, and some of our fishes come right across here. You'll see also this Kalahari sand. This was, in fact, a desertification of, during the Miocene in the last uh, about 8 million years ago. There was this great uh, desert and the sands and so forth. And it left its mark on the fishes. There was a major extinction at that time. And we now know, if you look at the pattern of fishes, we've got fishes over here, and they're related to fishes over here, but nothing in between. And around the rim of that basin, you've got relic faunas of fishes, and that tells us about this desertification period. And then, uh, going right further south, there was also, in the fairly couple of hundred, 100,000, years ago, 200,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum when the earth was very cold, we know there was another extinction that really 
affected the fisheries down south. And it probably also had an impact on the tropical fauna at a much cooler period uh, and restricted some of them. So just ideas that the scientists are formulating more and more. Uh, it's crystallizing now much better just how our fishes uh, came to be where they are at this moment. Just a little bit about the functioning of the delta before we move on. And that is, uh, we know that the catchment is up there in Angola. We know also that that's where the major rainfall happens over this period of time. In fact, when we're in there, summer, high summer through to autumn, it rains up in the highlands and the waters come down to the Cubango or the Quito drainages and then reach the delta somewhere between uh, late May and August, that period of time. Rather out of season for waters to be refreshing a system, as uh, normally that would happen in high summer. And uh, the delta itself consists, therefore, of a panhandle and a permanent swamp, and then the temporary swamp, and then the ephemerally very occasionally flooded wetland periods around the edges and so forth. And uh, the drainage down into the sump lake, what's called a sump lake in period when the water really comes down and the, uh, the waters are full, that lake may fill. Sometimes it dries up for some years and then it may fill again and so forth. But it's regarded as a sump lake down Lake Ngami. And occasionally the water goes down the Boteti River into the Mahadikadi pans and so forth. The interesting thing about the drainage is that the Cabango and the Quito are fundamentally different types of rivers, or the substrate are different. The Cabango is a rocky, a rocky based uh, substrate. And the Quito, on the other hand, is this Kalahari sand based thing. And what it does to the drainage is that the rains fall in the highlands, and if they fall in the Cabango side, the, the waters flow off much quicker because the substrate is hard. And if it falls in the Quito area over here, you'll see that it forms a sponge, and it takes longer for the waters to drain out. We see this in the hydrograph. You have a, a, a couple of years hydrograph showing the Okavango at Rundu. And what you see is a double peak. There, there's low, and then the rain starts, the waters rise, and the Kabango floods first, and then it tails off a bit, and then the waters of the Quito arrive. And then there's a long tail off over the dry period until the next season starts and so forth. And this, this has all sorts of ramifications for both the fauna and for its conservation and for the water resources for people and things like that. And we'll go to that later on in the talk. Let me get to the fishes. One of the big things about the fishes of the Okavango that we've come to realize is that it's actually an evolutionary arena of its own. And that you hear sometimes that the Great Lakes of Africa, there's been these species, flocks developing, radiating. Well, the same has happened with this big lake, this mega lake, and this great center of evolution that is uh, today the Okavango Basin. And the evidence of that exists in at least two and probably more groups. But here are the two most evident where speciation has happened. The largemouth cichlid, this group down here, many of them are familiar as both angling and as food fishes and so forth. And then in a group, an explosion of the cynodontus, the made chocolate catch fishes. And many people, they catch these, they just call them squeakers, and they don't bother to identify them because there's such a great variation. And where does one species start? and the other species end, it's very difficult to say. We'll talk a little bit more about them as we get on. So what do we know about our fish? 
The first thing I want to say is that, uh, that we are learning all the time. Uh, our exploration, and I don't want to put an exact number because tomorrow I'll be wrong. Somebody will come up and say there's a new species and we found this there and molecular science has uh, shown us that uh, what we thought was one species is now three species and so forth. So here is a picture, the background being the uh, exit of Lake Quito, which is a, some, a, a lake, a source lake at the, at the very source of the Quito River in Angola. And in that swamp there that you can see here, I put my net in a few years ago when I was part of an expedition and had a great a lot of fun netting the swamp land here at the end of this lake. And out of that, at least three or four or five species that I had never seen before came into my net. And uh, one of them, this one here, we've already described as a new species. I'll expose him a little bit later on. This is a, a little minnow that uh, is only found in other Angolan rivers to the north. Very pretty little animal. Uh, Enteromius chikapaensis is its name, after the Chikapa River in Angola. And then here, a snake catfish. At first, I thought it was our common snake catfish, but then he had no pelvic fins. And I thought, okay, what's going on here? And these are peat bogs. They're very thick mud, the, 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 the substrate. So when you're fishing there, you you, it's quite difficult to walk around because you, in fact, in thick mud. And this guy has adapted to that thick mud. He's more attenuated, he's more longer, and he's lost his spin. He doesn't need those spins. He need, needs to work and to move more like a snake than anything else. And in fact, uh, we're calling him the peat bog catfish. So also, he hasn't yet got a scientific name. So how many fishes and families do we have? And here is, in a nutshell, uh, the diversity of fishes in the Okavango system. So we've got at least 15, 16, 17 uh, families of, of fishes, and I'll run through them very quickly. This gives you an idea of their abundance. So some of the uh, groups, like this one here, which is the Cyprinidae in the orange there, the big corner of the pie. Most of the species, in fact, are either Cyprinids, and in a family we now call the Danionidae, and I'll show you them. The cichlids, the perch-like fishes, form another large segment of the pie. And then this whole triangle, which is also smaller, parts involved are what we call the catfishes, and I've circulated, circled them there, and uh, these are the catfishes, these ones here, and then there are others, many smaller, some of them only very small groups and so forth. Here in outline are representatives of those bands, the mormirids, the here, canariids, they only found in one species, uh, up in the highlands, so you won't encounter him unless you really go up into Angola and you collect uh, in rapid waters and so forth. The Elestidae include the tigerfish and a few of its relatives. Hepcetidae, the African pike, very well known to most people who visit the Okavango. The Disticodontids are very small and mostly overlooked by the common man. Cyprinids, I've already mentioned, the minnows, and uh, the Danionids, these are the uh, fast swimming, also minnow-like fishes. Then these are all catfishes, so there's the large air-breathing catfishes, the clarias, outlines there, but also the shieldbeards and another and a number of other smaller groups as well. Then this name, Procatopodidae, it's a fairly new name for a, for a family. These are the top minnows over here. 
uh, the cichlids, the perch-like fishes, there and there, and the anabantids, I'll introduce them just now, and the spiny eels down here, the mastic templates. In all, between 90 and 100 known species in the system. So here are the broad phylogenetic relationships of these fishes. And you can see there the more primitive ones, if you're starting off from the phylogenetic chain here, the more primitive ones are the more mirrored in the Danionids. And this whole branch here are called autophysins, because autophysins mean a connection and between the uh, swim bladder and the inner ear. And all of these fishes have that connection. It's a pre adaptation for freshwater fishes. It allows them to hear much, much better than most other organisms in water. And of course, sound and uh, the, the pressures and pressure waves of, of whatever causes them is a very important factor that we don't understand. Although you are listening to me, that's airwaves. So they listen to the sounds coming through the water. And these guys are particularly adapted for that. In the spiny eels, the cichlids, the anabanthids, and the procatopodids up there. Right, let's talk about some of the fishes, the more mirrors. The more mirrors are a very interesting African group of fish. They evolved in Africa. They came from nowhere. They're part of a very large, globally distributed, broader group. But the family itself is only African. And they are centered around the Congo Basin and West Africa is their center of evolution, where most of their diversity occurs and so forth. But there's spillovers into our area here, and we have a number of of the, the uh, genera represented. Strange looking fishes because they have snouts, they have very smooth, soft bodies, they have long, thin, strange bodies, and so forth. And that comes with reason. And the reason is that these guys can generate electricity. They have a modified muscles in their caudal peduncle, that long little part of their body there for their tail, and in it, the muscles work as an electro-generating, and they put out pulses of electricity. They use it much as birds do to communicate, uh, both with themselves and as a radar system. So they, they, they can pick up with this electrogenic field that they generate around themselves, both living and inanimate objects like rocks or reeds or sticks and stones and so forth, uh, just by distortion of that field that they can feel and we can't. So that's how they uh, perceive their environment. They also mainly work at night, so they don't need to do sight. They've got this wonderful view of the world uh, through a different sense. And each one has its own peculiar uh, signal that it generates and it is able to receive. They use this not only to perceive their environment, but to talk to each other, to pick up who's coming, who might be friends and might be enemies. Uh, uh, so they're great in communication and it's a behavioral tool. In their talking, they shout at each other and they. Uh, they whisper to each other and they do all sorts of things using electricity and so forth. So they are a wonderful group of fish and uh, a very popular one for studies by scientists. Then I'm going to uh, mention here the Osteriophysi, the Otophysi I've already spoken about. The Osteriophysi include the Snareas under what we call the anotophyte. So these only have a, the beginning in their body of this connection that I spoke about between the inner ear and the lung. And here is a cross section from above, and you can see the swim bladder and modified bones, much like in our own ears. 
uh, the bones have been modified to form a chain of articles that connect to the inner ear where they can hear the sound. And the, the swim bladder serves as a resonating chamber, and it gives them this very skill. Most of the Oterophyces occur in Africa, but one big group, the genotype forms, which are also electrogenic, don't occur in Africa. These are South American. They include the electric eel, the big electric eel that can generate very high voltage and it can shock you and so forth. Uh, the, but that's not a mormurid, and it's not closely related to the mormurid, but their system of communication of, have converged in evolution. So the cypriniform, the cithariniform, the catfishes, and the tiger fish and their allies are what we encounter in the in the so here's just a picture to give you an idea of what the barred minnows, this family, Danionidae, the shedrins as they know, mainly Asian in diversity, but a number, a, a whole lineage has evolved in Africa since it arrived after Africa connected with Asia. And this is what they look like there in the background. You see they're shoaling fishes, they're very streamlined, fast, open water, big mouth at the front there for taking in insects and anything they might encounter in the water columns themselves. Lovely fishes. You only find them in the river up at the top end. You won't find them down in the swamp uh, at all. They only occur in the Okavango River and tributaries. Then the cyprinids. The cyprinids are a marvelous group. They're very diverse, and there are three large groups of cyprinids. The labiani, down here, with strange mouths, bottom feeders. So if we look at the ecological food chain, these guys grab off the bottom, algae and so forth, and they on the base of converting primary productivity into secondary productivity. So then you get this very large group of minnows, Miliogastrini, as we now know them. Uh, they used to be called barbs, we no longer use that term, uh, and there are a large number of them. And I, I want to just, I'll tell you something about them, because a lot of people think, oh, minnows, what good are minnows and so forth? But you know what? They form a very important link in terms of the food chain, as food connecting between insects, and uh, smaller organisms and items that feed on them and so forth. And then, of course, the large yellowfish, there's only one species in the system, and it only occurs in the river. You never find it down in the delta itself. And, so and they are under another group. These are hexaploid. They've got six times the number of chromosomes than the uh, most of the minnows and the labii. They're very extraordinary animals in that respect, and that's another story of its own. The minnows, I'll just show this slide, because there's a pot that a colleague of mine took of a subsistence fisher. So these ladies had been in the water and with their scoop baskets and mostly catching just little minnows. And you think, oh, they're not doing very well, are they? They haven't got nice big pan fish to form for supper. But look at that soup. Look at that pot that they're cooking up. Full of minnows. Those minnows don't go to waste. They are a basic and a staple of the fish system in the Okavango. And here's another story from a minnow, if you think they are insignificant. They tell science a, a lot. So this is the straight fin minnow, uh, Enteromius paludinosus, as it's known. If you're going to lake, a dry in Lake Ngami, you're going to find this guy, one of the last caps there. Oh, if you're going to a flooding Lake Ngami, he's one of the first guys there first. And if you look at Africa, he's spread right from over here in Ethiopia, all the way down across high Africa, right down into southern Africa. He doesn't go to our very extreme because he's more of a tropical animal. And 
But if you look at the relationship that came out of a recent study on the molecules of what we took at one stage to be one species, we now know it to be several, some of which are not yet described. The original one is this one, described by Peters in the 1852, long time ago, yes, down on the, the mouth of the uh, Zambezi in Mozambique. And that is Enteromia solutinosis. But look where it is. The, the real distribution is a number of species stretching from the blue in the uh, northeast, uh, right up at the end of the Rift Valley, and then a number of branches that are very interesting for a scientist. The one being the green branch over here, which includes Congo, Zambia, and Mozambican. And the red branch here, which I've circled there, which comes down into Southern Africa. And you can see these are distinctly separated, uh, genetically speaking. So we've really got a little bit of a problem to deal with them uh, from the science. But look at the story they tell. Where did our fishes come from? And that's what I was telling you earlier on. This is the evidence we've got of where our fishes came from and the emerging insight that it gives us science. Cystica uh, in, the, uh, in Africa, an important group. If you go into the Congo, you get some really big ones. If you go into the lower Zambezi, you get a number of big ones. Kupi, uh, Chesa, those animals. You don't get them up in the Okavango. But in the Okavango, you just get these tiny little chaps of about two, three centimeters in size, and they are nipping. Uh, algae and little insects of the plant, almost out of sight, out of mind. Mostly. I've put another one here with a red line. It's not in the Okavango, it's in the Zambezi. It's probably one of the rarest animals that we have. We only knew it from a tiny stream near Mongu on the Barotsi floodplain until one of our Okavango expeditions went in into uh, the, uh, the Quango River and found the, uh, another population in Angola. So very, very rare, very small little animals. Its relatives are in the Congo. Right, the African pike. The African pike is an interesting guy. It was known for many years as one species in Africa called Hepsitis odu. Odu was prescribed from West Africa. Some really lovely studies done by uh, scientists in Tiburin, Belgium, have separated it now into about six species. So there are about six species of Hepcetus. And the one, the, one of the first ones to be described was by that collection, in that collection that I showed you in the, in the drawer in Liège. We, this, uh, this species is in, in that drawer, but it was described in the paper and it was described after the great French scientist, Hepcetus Cuvier, after the, the scientist at that time, Cuvier. And the interesting thing about these animals is they very predatory. And their whole body form says that they are uh, ambush predators. They wait quietly. They don't chase their prey. They wait for their prey and then, like a dragster, all the acceleration is in the rear end and they streamline and they charge out and catch the animal. So with a predator like that, you wouldn't suspect that it has a very interesting breeding pattern. It is one of, like lions, I suppose. They look after their young pretty much. They create a foam nest. There's a picture of a foam nest. There's a picture of it in the environment. And it's in these reed beds that they film these foam nests. And a pair of, of pipes will, will spawn under the foam nest. They create the foam nest. And the eggs float up into the nest where the larvae develop. As they develop to, free form, to a preformed state, they drop down in the nest and hang from below. And then 
they gradually disperse and so forth and their whole life cycle. So this predator has one of the most advanced breeding styles that you're likely to encounter in our fish. Right, a quick word about the tiger fish. You can't move through an African, uh, major African water without encountering and talking about the tiger fish. Tiger fish, we've got a, one of the species, Vitatus, was described from that collection that I spoke about. And there's a picture of it, very large. And so these, are, these ones are very different to other African fishes in the system in this way. They are scaled, they are streamlined, they, they've got nice fork fin for swimming, and you find them in that picture in the background, there you see them shoaling in open water. They've got teeth in their jaws, sharp teeth. Their relatives are those piranhas that you hear about in the Amazon. Yeah, those are, these are African piranhas, if you like. Sharp teeth, they just don't attack man, they attack insects, and in fact, this one here is also, like many of the piranhas, it eats on seeds and is vital to the seed production of things like um, lilies and so forth in the, in the delta. Uh, but let's just talk about the tiger fish quickly because you can't move on without the tiger fish. Here I want to also say, just look at that. Again, where do our fish come from? The carrisons, or the alestids as we now call them, are not of Asiatic uh, derivation. These guys show a relationship between Africa and South America. They were here before the Mayas. They've been here a long time. And many of the groups, the alestids, for example, are exclusively African in their in their derivation. And the tiger fish was recently, we did a phylogeny, and this is the relationship. And what we found was in this, in the Congo, and in an area up there towards uh, where I was telling you, the, the Rift Valley and Lake Mweru and the headwaters of the Congo, and then the Chambeshi, and intersecting with Southern Africa, there's a number of species as yet to be described of tiger fish. And uh, it just shows the nexus, the importance and the relevance of the rifting in terms of both severing distribution and creating new uh, distribution patterns for the evolution of, of our fishes and so forth. Catfishes. I've got to be brief here because they're a very big group. Some of them are nondescript and small. This, this one here is a Zyrixi, named after uh, former Zaire, uh, and it lives in sandbanks. This is a, uh, an amphilid catfish. They, have, they don't have spines like most catfishes. You find them in rapids, only in rapids and fast moving water. Then most characteristic catfishes have spine, a spine, strong spine in the dorsal and the pectoral fin. And these are defensive spines. Uh, probably best of all known in something like the squeaker group here, where these spines are very big and very effective. Sometimes you'll find a tiger fish with a squeaker locked his spine and forming a triangle and chokes the tiger fish that's trying to swallow him. And then, of course, the very large group, the clarid or air-breathing catfish. These are very well known and popular in Africa, and they also shared with Asia as uh, these families. And they're very important as food fishes. Often you'll go there; they're large, and they're caught by uh, locals and uh, net and all sorts of things, and they are valued as food fishes, you know. Very big group in Africa, and uh, but also tropical in distribution. There, again, the same story that, I'm, that I was telling you. I, I come from the south. I'm, I'm, I'm here in South Africa, down on the coast down here, 
And my view of Africa is always looking upward. And I, I knew that this catfish was described from the Orange River system. And I always thought my perception was around the wrong way because it was the Orange River system. And I thought, well, okay, everything goes from there. Whereas it doesn't. Your perception has to come from East Africa. And this is where the origin, the roots of diversity of this particular group and this lineage, one of the most widespread species in Africa comes from. And the recent paper put out by Belgian scientists has showed the pathways as, as revealed by the genetic study. And it comes again, it shows that important link between East Africa and Southern Africa in terms of fish distribution. And then just a word on this uh, terrific radiation of Mochokas catfishes, the squeakers. And uh, many of my colleagues uh, sort of say, you, it's almost impossible to identify many of the species because there is such a range of pigment pattern that confuses the distribution. But if you look closely at the mouth form uh, and the teeth and things like that, you begin to discern the group. And there are different species. What we might be witnessing here, though, is incomplete evolution. So this lake, that the Paleo Lake, where a lot of the evolutionary radiation took place, was probably too short in evolutionary time before it collapsed and all the, the founding uh, lineages were thrust together in the same tub, if you like, and, and evolution hadn't completely uh, formed itself. And that's why there's probably a lot of hybridization taking place and mixing of the gender. Anyway, very interesting, very beautiful. Uh, widespread in Africa, uh, some big blocks in Lake Tanganyika, places like that. But we've got an interesting group in our own Okavango base. And then the, the little top minnows, another group that you just, if, you, if you're walking through the shallows, you often see these little fishes in the shallows, and they've got beautiful blue eyes. Uh, they, the Afrikaans word for them is lampworki, mean lamp eyes. They look like glowing little lights in the in the water. And they're very pretty fishes. They're popular with aquarists and so forth. And uh, there's a, a group that we uh, at last beginning to get their relationships tied down very much. We are now calling them under the genus Lacus Ficola. Uh, but even that is, no, is not firmly entrenched and they're likely to be uh, found a new genus uh, in, in the years to come. But we had a postdoc, Pedro Berganza, who did some wonderful work on developing what is now known as the Procatapodidae and their relationship and uh, put them on the map and so forth. Very attractive little group. I mentioned this one. Some people say, oh, well, what are you putting a nothobranchius in the Okavango? Well, he's part of it just not part of the delta and not part of the, the swamp system as such. But the nothobranchias are known as annual killifishes in Africa. A very, very interesting group and uh, been particularly well studied in the last decade or so by several groups of scientists. And what, what uh, we have found with this guy, found only in Caprivi, on the one bank, on the one side of the Zambezi system, between the Zambezi and the Okavango rivers. Uh, and in there, there are some dryland pans that dry out in summer, and you find this Nothobranchius capriviensis. This is what the male looks like. These animals are very interesting because they, amongst the shortest lived in terms of, of uh, adults and breeding and so forth, they grow up, they live their life in a dry, in a temporary pan. So their whole life cycle from birth to death 
uh, takes place in a couple of months. And what happens is they lay their eggs in the mud and the eggs are resilient and they can withstand a desiccation. They, the development takes place in those eggs and when the rains come again, the eggs are ready to hatch. And they hatch very quickly. They grow very quickly on all the nutrients and the little insects and so forth. And they mate and breed and then the pan dries out and so forth. And what we find quite interestingly is that our one in Caprivi here traces a line of, of drainage line way back into the Chambeshi, the Kafuri, and into the upper reaches of the Congo system, the Upembe Swamp, Lake Mueru, and so forth. That's the lineage that we've got in, in this part. Once again, telling us the story of where our fishes might have come and how the paleo drainages evolved and so forth. Very interesting little group of a time. Right, the cichlids. The cichlids are very, very interesting. All our fishes are interesting. You've probably gathered by now. But these are important fishes. They include the Oreochromus, or what we call tilapia fishes. Uh, these are important food fishes. In fact, um, Oreochromus nilotikus, which doesn't occur naturally. It may be an invasive species very soon, if we know what we do know. And, um, but Oreochromus andersoni is a very important uh, food fish in Africa in, in those parts. Very nice to eat and so forth. The largemouth cichlid, predatory cichlid, uh, many of the smaller river iron cichlid, things like that. The southern mouth brooders, smaller cichlids, but nonetheless a very interesting diversity. And this is what their relationships look like. So the one group here, the hemichromies, are relatively primitive cichlids on a group and a, a line by themselves. And we've got one species in the in the Okavango uh, hemichromus elongated. There's a little bit of a dispute going on. Yes, scientists do argue amongst themselves. And I disagree with some of uh, the recent work that's been put out that's calling it angolensis. And I'm saying, no, angolensis occurs down in the coastal areas of Angola. Elongated, or what we might think is a possibly undescribed species, but very close to what is known as elongated, is the one in the Okavango and the Zambezi. And then you've got what we are now calling Haplotilapion. Now that's a, that's a real mishmash from a scientific perspective, because in the past we used to talk about Haplochromine and Tilapion. Well, the the molecular work has shown that they all belong together in a lineage here, and this is their relationship. Oreochromines are mainly, mainly East African, with a branch stretching into the Okavango from the East Africa. The Boreotilapines are mainly West African, with one species, Coptodon uh, rendali, the red breasted breed, coming into from the Congo side of things. And then these other groups, the tilapia, of which there's tilapia spamini and a few smaller tilapia, and pseudocrenilabris and its allies also come in. So we're learning a lot now uh, that we didn't know before through molecular work. The Anabantas. The Anabantas are uh, a group that are very interesting because these uh, are shared with Asia. And a recent paper showed that there was a fossil up in the Tibetan Plateau. Would you believe it? And that fossil anabantid showed that when India crashed into Asia and the Himalaya mountain rise, the anabantids were present on those shores. And as, it, as the, the, the mountains rose, the fossil that was there in the shoreline was eventually elevated to 
uh, the Tibetan plateau. What it did tell us was how old the group is and that their origin and that uh, th this group came into Africa on a very early stage of collision between Asia and Africa. They're interesting because they can air breathe and they also, some of them, form bubble nets very much like the pike. And this one here is the one you get in the delta, very pretty little animal. They're not very big, about 50 millimeters or so. And if you look carefully, you might find them breeding. Aquarists love them because of this. And this is the one that we described from the Quito bog. And you can see Microtinopoma C. Boise is its name. You're going to come across that name uh, in my last slide of the talk. And then I'm just going to mention, because they are occurring there, is the spiny eels. I don't want to say too much at this stage because they have a story of their own as well. They also are linked with Asia, and they are they mainly Africans uh, in uh, the Great Lakes, in the Congo. There are flocks of these. In Lake Tanganyika, there are a whole flock of mass assembled eels, but in our part, there's just two species. You know, one with fewer spines, uh, mass assembled Spandavali, and this one up here and there, same one with few longer spines, uh, mass assembled uh, Phrenatus. And uh, they're called spiny eels because they are higher fishes with the spines along their back. So that's the fish diversity. Well, it's a treasure house and it's a treasure chest of diversity that's worth conserving if anything is worth conserving on this planet. But as we know, human population is growing and climate change is happening as a result of human actions. And these are growing threats. So look at the population of Africa. This is a map taken in 2022 showing the population density in graphic form. And you can see uh, where there's dry land and Okavango. There's not too many people up there, but all around here in South Africa and High Felt, look at East Africa around the Great Lakes, around Lake Victoria, Ethiopia, Nigeria, forests and so forth. Africa has a huge population rapidly impacting on its natural environment. And of course, global change. Here's the temperature uh, of, of, since the last 50, 60, 100 years maybe. And you can see last year, 2023, was way beyond the norm of, of, of temperature, global temperature, way beyond the norm. And so there's a, a climate crisis looming and our, and our weather patterns are beginning to behave strangely and so forth. These are growing threats, largely beyond the uh, realm of individual actions, but collective human action is necessary to, to stem those tides, if, if possible at this point. But there are a lot of things happening in the Okavango Delta that are of direct uh, impact, both on the fishes and, and the, the, the landscape and everything else. There's a huge knowledge gap. Uh, our studies uh, and, and the group have shown that this area here in Africa, there's the Okavango Delta. This is uh, the number of botanical records in Africa as represented to collections and so forth. And you can see here, there's a large gap in the Okavango capture. Largely as a result of the conflict that's come in taking place there over many years, uh, the remoteness of the park, and so forth. Water extraction. Big pipelines, this is the Eastern National Water Carrier carrying water, originally planned from Rundu to Vintu in Namibia, and uh, not yet connected, but still uh, of direct relevance. There's still a lot of water extraction taking place along the riverbanks and so on. Over exploitation of resources. The uh, fishermen come in with gill nets and uh, 
they, they, they take out everything and they dry it up, take it off to the copper mines or wherever. But it's a major threat to the diversity of fishes in the Okavango Basin. Huge agricultural developments are taking place, regular burning of peatlands and so forth, impacts on the environment. All of these are direct threats that we need to address. So if we summarize the future of the Delta and where it's going, we find that uh, in, in the Delta area itself and downstream reaches, there are lots of people, lots of towns around it, around the edges, agriculture taking place, ecotourism, the number of lodges, there, there are dozens of uh, tourist lodges bringing the economy, very important for the economy of the area and so forth. Agriculture is expanding, fishing and pollution are taking place and water extraction. Those are all direct threats taking place in that part of the world. Up in this rocky base, uh, Kubango drainage, there are lots of people, towns are developing, agriculture, dams are being planned and water extraction is large scale. Here in the Crito, Vain in that sedimentary Kalahari base. It's the water tower. It's known as a water tower for the Yokovanga. There are few people. There's little development. There's data poor. We don't know very much what's going on there. And it also represents the conservation hope. If they can protect this part of the catchment, at least a regular water supply and the uh, will be uh, guaranteed, if you like, uh, to flow into the delta and keep it alive, keep it from drying out, from being totally destroyed and so forth. So there is hope, but it takes collective act. It means the nations of this area have to work together, have to hold hands, have to trust each other and work together to conserve that place. And one of the projects that I've been uh, fortunately uh, engaged with is this Okavango Wilderness Project uh, run by the Wild Bird Trust. They now have a, a proper office and centre. There's the Wild Bird Trust of Botswana set up. They've got a Wild Bird Trust in Namibia, in Angola. I'm not sure about Zambia, but at least in those three countries and South Africa, they've got this centre. And the leader of this is Dr. Steve Boys, after whom I named that little fish. It's a little fish, but it's an important name. Remember that name. Wonderful man with lots of energy, lots of vision, and his vision and mission. He did his PhD in the Okavango Delta on Mayo's Paris. He's an ornithologist, but he's a wonderful, energized, and he's mobilized massive sums of money. And he, what he he does is he, he engages politicians at the top level and brings them on board and then engages local people through uh, expeditions and trips and then publishes this widely and brings the knowledge at home and brings in the benefits of global conservation funding and so forth. And uh, as far as I'm aware that Quito Valley is largely now protected area, and the people there are integrated into the conservation plans and so forth. And this is, you can read about one of those expeditions that took place in the November 2017 National Geographic, if you're more interested. But this is an ongoing work. They're currently full of expeditions. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that people can do for conservation. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you've learned something. I hope you realize now that there are wonderful fishes in the Okavango and that they are worth conserving, worth your time and energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, your knowledge on this topic is clearly deep and wide, and we really enjoyed this. So we're coming to the part of the um, presentation where we open the floor for questions and answers. 
and especially we want to give the students in uh, Botswana a chance to participate in, in the conversation. Um, Richard, I would just like to check if you are ready to participate. Thanks, Johan. We, we are ready. Okay, wonderful. Um, if you've got a question, you're welcome to to read it to to the professor. I'm not sure if you want to let the students walk up to the to the mic and ask them let them ask the questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll I'll let the students uh, raise their hands and come to uh, present their questions. But first, I would want to first appreciate uh, uh, Paul's Prof. Uh, Paul Skelton. And it's a, a privilege to be a live audience to his talk because we have used uh, his book, uh, A Field Guide to Fishes of Southern Africa, a lot. I've, I've used that uh, as far as at my undergrad level. So I've known him for a long time, but it's a, it's a very big privilege to see him live and inter uh, interact with him life. So thank you very much, uh, Prof, for making time for us. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a motivation for, for the students. It's a privilege. So I'll let my students to, you know, um, come forth and share their questions and and comments, whatever you, you want to, to say. Yeah, you can come, come forward. You first say your name and then, yeah, you can share. Uh, you mentioned a lot of fish species uh, thriving in the Okavango Delta. So I wanted to know like, which of these species are most impacted by climate change and um, how many of them should we prioritize for conservation because of the like, growing impacts of climate change and, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that's a, an interesting question, of course. The answer is, is not always easy to give, but some of the fishes are more sensitive than others. Some of them are very uncommon. They only occur in certain environments. Others are hardy and, and strong and uh, occur widespread and so forth. However, the, the real answer to the question is you can't focus on one or two species and try to conserve them. You have to conserve the system. To, do, to aim at anything less than that, you are not going to achieve it because you cannot separate an organism from the community of which it is part. So I would rather answer and say that instead of focusing on individuals, focus on the whole. Or if you do focus on individuals, focus on the hardiest, on the toughest, because then you're going to then you're going to conserve a whole lot of others together with that one. Does that make sense? Okay, he's he's happy with the answer. So, Prof, talking about the environment, um, is the water chemistry of the Quito and Kubango different, uh, such that maybe we can have, you know, slightly different chemistries in, in the two peaks uh, down downstream? Thank you. Another interesting question. So, I explained that. The, the the ground base to both those uh, branches of the system is different, and uh, and the other part of that difference is the way the water flows through the system. So in the rocky part, the water flows off very quickly, and and reaches uh, the, the the delta much sooner than the other. In the other part, it, it drains and enters the swamp and picks up nutrients and so forth. And, uh, and, but it comes down, it's also filtered very nicely by the system. The water quality itself is mingled 
before it enters this this because the Quito and the and the Quanabal uh, and the um, and the Cubango mix uh, meet before they actually come down into the delta. So what comes into the delta is a single quality water system, if you know what I mean. Do are they different? The, I, I can't answer that specifically because I don't know it specifically. But I, I can say that there will be minor differences. But pollution from man-made sources will change the water quality significantly. And there I'll say to you, the entire Kubango along the, the uh, boundary, along the border between Namibia and Angola is populated very heavily. There's a lot of agriculture taking place. There are towns, and there is uh, there's also spraying for uh, things like malaria control and whatnot. So the water quality there is definitely different from the pollution perspective uh, to that which you encounter coming down the Quito. Um, if the if the audience would like to ask some questions, you're also welcome. You can just raise your hands, use the tools at the bottom of the screen, or you can um, switch on your video feed and wave at us. Please tell us who you are and then introduce your question. Okay, my name is Elisa. So I heard Prof talking about the the role of the cy cyprinids in the food food chain. So hmm. can at least provide examples of how the changes in the Sinopris population impact the the stability of the 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 entire food chain. Thank you. Uh, the ecological relationships are very interesting. One of the thing that we we realize, particularly downstream in the delta and so forth is that over a year cycle, the populations change in numbers, in density, tremendously. Uh, and there's a, there's a great crash, if you like, during the dry season when the water bodies are concentrated, when the predatory systems uh, can take effect and so forth. And then they build up over the the summertime and, and the breeding and so forth. So when you talk about a food chain and you talk about the cyprinids, I've, I've deliberately pointed out that the role of some of these cyprinids is often overlooked. You, we often focus on the big boys, on, on the tiger fish or the, the big clarius or the uh, large mouth uh, breeds and so forth. They're the predators. It's like me. If I took you into the game reserve and I just, all I heard you wanted to see were lions and leopards because they're the cats and they're the predators. And you ignored the ants or you ignored the, the, the little buck or the butterflies and so forth. And that is the same effect that I'm trying to draw in saying that the cyprinids, the little minnows, many of them, most people don't even look, or they look at them and they just see one kind, when there is probably a greater diversity of minnows than any other group and so forth. So, and each of those kinds has its own life cycle, has its own speciality, has its own habit, whether it's daytime eating, bottom eating, whether it's shoals, whether it feeds up uh, insects, or whether it grabs on the bottom and so forth. So, so when you talk at food chain, I'm trying to say to you that the role of those nondescript, those little things that we often ignore, is sometimes fundamental. And if you remove them from the food chain for some or other reason, you often then create a weak link and the chain collapses. And that has often that has happened in in occasions where you have a trophic cascade taking place. The best trophic cascades I can often refer you to is when an alien invasive is introduced, and that alien invasive has a major impact 
it either comes in as a disease bearer or as a predatory animal, something like that. And it, crea it, it, it creates a, an impact that knocks on down through the food chain. So I don't know if I'm explaining this clearly to you, but that's what I was trying to refer in talking about those little minnows as special. Yeah, she's happy. I just want to add, Prof, that uh, I, I just forgot the scientific name, John Stock Minnow. Um, it's been found to, you know, distribute to disperse seeds such yes. that can um, influence um, vegetation communities. So that's, um, you know, you can overlook it when you, you look at it, but it's, uh, it's got those, um, you know, really important ecological roles. Yes. So any questions? Yes, let, let, me, let me just describe a, a little incident that, that illustrates this quite nicely. So I once, uh, many years ago, I collected a, a little cynodontist in yeah. the Okavango River, and I brought him home and put him in my tank. This, yeah. this cynodontist, this squeaker, lived for 30 years in my fish tank at home. And about a year ago, it died. And you know what? My whole fish tank took a change. And suddenly the plants started uh, disappearing and all sorts of things like that and I, I said well what's happened one fish has gone from the system and what was happening was the cynodontist was eating the snails so I've got snails in the tank to clean the algae and as they bred the small snails were being controlled by the squeaker when the squeaker died the small snails proliferated and they then impacted on the plant and so it, you don't realize that the eating of the snails by the cynodontist was in fact having a major ecological impact down the road. Thank you, Prof. I think you can use that as an example for key, keystone species. Yeah. Uh, anyone to come forward? So let me ask one more question on their yeah. behalf. So the Okavango Delta is... Uh, nutrient poor is oligotrophic how is it able to sustain uh, that um, um uh, that diversity of fish um yeah how does it support how is it able to support uh, you know good populations of fish throughout yeah. the year yeah okay so the okavango is a big system uh if 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 flowed out to the sea if it do if it didn't stop and dive and and flow into the delta and so forth uh, it would be a major contributor you know downstream and so forth the delta in its spread embraces an enormous number of different habitats and different areas what it does is go from a channel into a, it spreads out flat and in that flatness there's a lot of energy coming from this uh, from the sun first of all much more greater exposure onto the same water resource but a much greater surface area the plant life has expanded considerably the animals and the nutrient cycling of animals and their pollu not pollution but their nutrient uh, cycling, as I call it, is taking place. All of that can sustain a lot more diversity than just a simple river channel. So you 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 get you get both in a rocky river and a sandy bank river and so forth diversity. But then in the delta, you get this amazing uh, explosion. Of ecological diversity, and in that you get this wonderful diversity of of, of fishes that can exploit that. Thank you, Prof. Thanks, Richard. That was a great question. It feels like an exam question as well, um, with a great answer. And Prof, the, for your next um, appearance on Share Screen Africa, I'm going to have to ask you to talk about your fish tank. 
Um, I see there is a, um, a hand up. Kirsten, you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, your, your presentation was absolutely beautiful and really um, yeah, very beautifully illustrated. I can tell that you have uh, written a couple of books. Um, I wanted to ask you about whether there has been much of uh, much invasion of uh, exotic plants, aquatic plants in the system, and whether that has had an impact on the fish communities. Thanks, Kirsten. I, I, I do know that there's been a major, right going back many, many years to the 80s and 90s, water affairs had a, a major campaign to prevent the uh, spread of salvinia. Salvinia is what we commonly known as Kariba weed in the Zambezi system. And Kariba weed, salvinia, came downstream from uh, Zambian sources. We're not quite sure how, exactly how it started. And as far as, and it was very difficult to control that. Why? Because hippos and uh, the drying out and uh, so forth and uh, would, would cross boundaries. There's very little respect by elephants and hippos and a lot of animals and the floods itself uh, towards these things. But I do know that they were very successful, but it was a very uh, concentrated campaign by Botswana to keep Salvinia out of the Delta. I don't know, but I have not heard over the years that there is a major water plant uh, problem in the Delta itself, other than that that I've spoken about. Uh, as far as alien and alien spread is concerned, it's almost remarkable that nothing of major import has really impacted on the Delta yet. In the Zambezi, there's been the spread of a number of alien species like the Nile tilapia. And, um, and there's, a, there, there's a debate about whether that's a good or a bad thing, depending whether you're just looking at it as a food source or whether you are seeing it as, a, uh, as an alien animal, uh, a, a scientific perspective, if you like. But the, in, uh, the arrival of, of Nile tilapia in the Zambezi and its rapid spread there came with all sorts of ramifications, including the, the rapid spread of fungus, uh, EO, EUS as it's called, epizootic uh, ulcerative syndrome, uh, the fungus that affects a large number of fishes. And so uh, alien bring problems of their own, ecological problems of great economic import. They cost a lot to control or, or they impact on fisheries and things like that. Many of the people seeing a, a fungus infected fish will not eat it, will not touch it. They, they, for obvious reasons, it, does, it doesn't look the same. And uh, I, I do know that EUS has not been detected as far as I know in the Delta. I have found it up in Angolan sources and it's a matter of time before that and things like uh, tilo uh, Nile tilapia reach downstream. They are released up in Angola already. So uh, it's, a, it's a sort of plague, if you like, a plague that uh, sooner or later it will come. And uh, I just hope that it doesn't have the negative effect that it can possibly have on the fish resources because the fish resources are not just other resources. They are major resources for the food, the sustain, you know, subsistence fishing and so forth uh, in Botswana. They have a large number of people. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Prof, there's a, there's a question in the chat uh, from Delphine. And I'm going to read it out to you. Yes. As a follow up to the question on water quality um, through the rivers merge, though the rivers merge before reaching the delta, 
does the fact that the waters from the two rivers peak at different time of the year have an impact on the water quality reaching the delta, at least for some weeks or months? And what kind of impact might this have on the system? Okay, so the, the, the one, the, the big impact, impact of, of the arriving flood, uh, if you, you have to be there sometimes to witness it, but it, it moves from, in, in the panhandle, it moves, and as you get to the lower end of the panhandle, it, it, it moves out of the channel into these, these various uh, lagoons and places like that, and it moves through the, 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 the marsh, through the, the Pragmites marshes. And what it does then is it flushes deoxygenated water out of those swampy areas that's been lying there for you know, a good couple of months with rotting vegetation, and so forth, deoxygen. And you often find fish kills taking place in the lagoons themselves as the floodwaters push into the system and so forth. And that's a deoxygen uh, thing. It's not so much a water quality, abrupt water quality change. The water quality of the Okavango system generally is very high, very good. Very, it's not polluted by, uh, you know, ground, uh, ground elements and so forth, as to the point of uh, turbidity or things like that. They're very pure because they come through the sands, which are themselves filtering, and then through the swamplands of the Quito. And in the Cubango side, it's rocky and it's, it's not a highly erosive soil. It's not very uh, turbid in nature. So, uh, by and large, the water quality is good, but the deoxygenation of the swamps themselves is a major factor that happens uh, at the arrival of the floods. Um, Prof, I don't see any further questions at this point, so thank you so much for your time. It was a real treat to listen to you. I just want to actually ask one question myself that I just remembered. <laughs> we referred to, we often refer to the coelacanth in the ocean as the as the as a living fossil. Yes. Is there anything in the Okavango that's similar? What what about the age of uh, fish species in the Okavango? Are there some swimming fossils there? No, not not what you not not we scientists would put in the the fossil um, category. Mm -hmm. Very ancient. You know, in Africa, you get what they call the lungfish, and the the African lungfish, yep. which there are several species, is a very ancient lineage. Living fossils like the coelacan, the, the the reason why they call fossils is that they morphologically they haven't changed very much over millions of years in form. So uh -huh. the lineages that I talk to you about all go back a long period of time. I mean, we can talk about any of those things, and they can be traced back a long period of time. All you're seeing today is the living representatives of, of, of ancient lineage. When you get something like the African lungfish, its form is almost the same as 60, 70 million years ago. But whether the species is the same is, is another question. Most of the lungfish, for example, I've seen have probably been around uh, in a species for something like 5, 10, 15 million years. Not long in geological terms. But those would be ancient groups on the African uh, landscape. There are a couple of others. The Polypterids are very ancient and so forth. And there are a couple of other freakish little guys in the Congo and so forth that go back a long period of time. Uh, those Nereids, uh, there's one species up in Angola. It's an ancient lineage, but the species themselves are not necessarily old. So, so they are old forms. The Mormirids are old uh, in lineage. Uh, but again, the, 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 the modern representatives are modern. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it actually all on the coelacanth, uh, uh, you know, scale of things. No, no it's yeah. it's it's a fantastic answer. Um, 
the answers to your questions are, are to the questions today are, are often a bit complex. So it's 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 great that you answer it in that way. Richard, if you don't have any further questions there, then we are going to close for today. And please join us again tomorrow as we look again at the issue of global change biology uh, in the context of climate change and the Okavango. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof, once again. Have a brilliant afternoon. Bye-bye, everybody.